there are sometimes more than one way to get to a certain spot, and the objectives, which are nicely varied, sometimes have more than one solution. The streamlining continues, and here it does go a little bit far once or twice, but again, it's usually a good thing. They bring back the map, completely absent from Pandora Tomorrow, and this time they do something good with it. It's a 3D model, which you can rotate 360 degrees, and while it doesn't tell you exactly where you are, it does highlight that area. And there are red squares where your goals are. Of these three, this has the least trying to figure out what you're supposed to do. The music is good, not entirely sure it's as good as the first two. The multiplayer, I again haven't played the multiplayer, but it sounds fun. There's co-op and versus, and in versus, extraction, neutralization, bombing, discount mode, and deathmatch. And we finally get some replayability with unlockables and a percentage rating that tells you how well you did. And that brings us to Double Agent. Now I got this game for the Wii, so my review is going to be based on that version. I'll start by addressing the elephant in the room. Hi Wilbur. I'm joking. Yes, the graphics are not as good as the first three, because it's on the Wii. You ask me, it's a trade-off. Either you get the fun motion controls that means that everybody can just pick up a controller and play something on the Wii, or you go for next-gen level graphics, no motion controls, and the more familiar joystick, or something like it. No, the graphics aren't as good, and it's especially visible in the lighting shadow thing. Now you can very clearly tell where Sam Fisher is, no matter how much he's hiding, but it doesn't really interfere with the gameplay. It makes it less immersive, less convincing, but it's not like you'll be thinking that you're hidden and you won't be, or vice versa, because the meter still tells you how lit you're supposed to be. You use the Wiimote as the Wiimote is sort of in place of the mouse. Basically, and you're already going to know this if you've played one of the other games that do this because it's not entirely uncommon. It's how the Wii handles first person or third person perspectives. Dynamic camera. It's the same for the conduit, it's the same for the conduit, and red steel. You point the Wiimote at the screen to hold the camera still. If you point it at the center, the camera will not move. If you point it to your left, the camera will turn left. Up, you get the idea. Maybe this takes some getting used to. I personally didn't really have any problems with it. I think if you've played other Wii games and you're comfortable with the Wii mode, especially if you've played something that requires you to hold it still, like one of the driving games where you use the Wii mode as the steering wheel, you'll be fine. Obviously you can't play it until you have gotten used to that that's how it controls. I was very surprised that they managed to fit all of those controls onto the, what, dozen or so buttons on the Wii mode and nunchuck, and it really wasn't awkward or difficult to remember. It just works. Use the little control pad, you know, the four directional keys to arm yourself, choose the weapon, switch vision mode. It works well. Obviously B is your trigger, and you now do have to get used to that where before it was the mouse wheel that determined your speed, now it's how much pressure you apply to the control stick. But again, as long as you get into it using some other Wii games first, it will not prove terribly difficult. This time around, Sam Fisher's daughter dies in an incredibly meaningless fashion. The otherwise quiet and reserved man, whom we have before noted was clearly devoted to his daughter, completely loses it. He very quickly gets himself thrown into jail, where he gets in touch with the wrong crowd, and it really seems like Third Echelon has lost their best field operative. Or have they? In reality, he's gone undercover. 
in the wake of his daughter's death, he agrees to undertake the most desperate and dangerous mission of his career. To infiltrate a terrorist group, posing as one of them. The game is a ton of fun. One of the very first missions has you escaping from the prison, and honestly, it is right out of one of the best episodes of Prison Break. From there on out, you go on missions with the terrorists, for the terrorists, and you get a mission and a counter mission. Think early alias. Shut up, that was a fun show. Granted, the ending was rushed and unsatisfying, but at least it had an ending. And maybe it's just a JJ thing. I hear the ending of Lost is horrible also. Yes, I'm the one person on the planet who hasn't watched it yet. Don't you dare spoil it. Now, obviously, you can't complete both objectives. Now, obviously, you cannot do everything for both sides. One mission has you on a ship, and you have to decide if you're going to prevent the deaths of 2,000 people or ensure it. You have to make some real important moral decisions, because if you lean too much towards one side, either the NSA or the terrorists, the other side will stop trusting you. Unfortunately, they did what maybe had to be done in order to prevent the game from just ending if you let yourself go too much to one side. Basically, you'll get like a last chance kind of thing to prove your loyalty to that side. You'll get a timed objective that you have to immediately carry out. With that said, it's still very immersive and a lot of fun, and a great challenge. The level of trust either side has in you also affects what you get to use of equipment. And yes, they do kind of explain how you get to keep using spy stuff. Basically, the guy who's been giving you missions throughout these games, Lambert, poses as a gun runner for the terrorists so that he can sell you equipment that you then get to use. I made it a little thin. The storytelling in between missions consists of full CGI cutscenes, immensely effective, fantastic cinematography and editing, and then this ongoing phone call between the assistant director and Fisher, supplemented with a documentary-like mix of still photographs and moving footage. And they can vary based on the choices you make. And then there are in-engine cutscenes as well. Dialogue is great, the banter is hilarious. The story is very engaging and the ending is magnificent. The score now has this kind of gritty, dirty tone to it and it fits perfectly. The AI is good with a few exceptions. Honestly, I cannot imagine using a 360 degree camera without a mouse or a Wiimote. I really can't imagine how that can be good on a console. The controls are very intuitive, easy to use, and the sensitivity of them is just right. The only thing that is a little bit awkward is that to jump you have to kind of flick the nunchuck, and that's the only strong movement. I mean, other than that, we're talking slight twists of the wrists and such. For example, to put your back up against a wall, you twist your wrist with a nunchuck a little bit. So it's the only wild movement, and it does seem a little bit out of place, even if it is for a movement such as a jump. The lock picking is very frustrating, but maybe if you've played one of the first three with the joystick, you will be more used to it. In this, you kind of have to twist your wrist with the Wiimote to figure out the exact position, and it can just be kind of irritating, and near the end, it seems like you're doing it forever. Hacking is a ton of fun in this one. The gameplay isn't at all cannibalized to help make it work on the Wii console. I read somewhere that it's the same as on the PS2. I can neither confirm nor deny that. Throwing bottles and such to distract is completely useless. It never worked for me in this game, but whistling does. 